Um, I'll begin with an assertion, I think. There have been many times in which the Scottish working class has contributed to the turning of history at a British level. But there have been only two occasions when they have led that. One was the 1919 general strike, and the second was the UCS. And what I want to do is focus on how the working, 40 years ago, changed the course of history and what we can learn from it. First on the background, there are close similarities, strangely, to the situation we're in today. We've had then a far-reaching economic crisis. We have one today. We had then a Conservative government that was both arrogant, overconfident, and divided. I think we've got one of them today. And a working population across Britain, which though economically quite militant, appeared at that stage to have become politically quite passive. Just a little bit about the economic crisis. Then it was international, far-reaching. Those years, 1970 to 72, saw the devaluation of the dollar and the end of that monetary framework that sustained the welfare state ever since 1945. Rapidly rising inflation, rising unemployment, and the banks going bankrupt. That was 1971 to 72. Background to the division in the Conservative government. This is important because only when you understand that do you understand the subtlety of the tactics of the stewards. You had two factions. One, a neoliberal one, around Keith Joseph, who always opposed post-war Keynesian full employment policies. They said it gave too much power to the workers. And now they had started to build a base among the regional barons of industry, including those on Clydeside. And secondly, you had the more traditional welfare state Tories around Heath. They weren't particularly good people, but they had a different outlook on life. They were largely linked to the City of London and the big multinational companies it controlled. They wanted to enter the common market. They wanted to control the trade union movement, not through confrontation directly, but via the law and via a right-wing leadership collaborating with the law. They wanted to complete what Wilson had tried and failed to do. Both, effectively, were the spokespersons of big business, but in a different way, different ways. Both were very, very concerned at the time about how to maintain the base of the Conservative Party among small and medium business. They were concerned about the degree to which it was ebbing away as a result of inflation. And we should remember the small size of big business in terms of the population. It represents 0.1 of the population, while small business amounts to 10%, a crucial base for the Conservative Party. So, just before the election, there was a temporary pact called the Selsden Agreement, by which they patched up their agreements and went into the election. So, that's the political background. Background on the Clyde, I think I'm going to hear all of that from Davy, so I'll abridge it. But yeah. the, the shipyard owners were <coughs> people who ripped out the profits, didn't reinvest, and lost their markets. And by the mid-1960s, the shipyards on the Clyde were in crisis. They were going bankrupt. Uh, there was a takeover in two stages of first the Fairfield Yard in Govan, and then all the yards on the Upper Clyde by the Labour government in order to try and save them. But they saved them a rather a strange way. They gave large amounts of compensation to the old owners and then put the old owners back on the board. Get on with it. Yeah? And of course, it didn't work very well. But at the same time, the shop stewards in that UCS were exerting a new power because they all came together across yards and across different trades and different grades, including the junior management and the draftsmen. And they were able to negotiate in that period big advances in both wages and shift patterns to a degree that the shipyard owners on the lower Clyde 
led by Mr. Lithgow, or Sir William, what was he? Sir William, Sir William, Sir William, Sir William. Sir William. Yeah, Sir William Lithgow, were very annoyed Touch and fall angry up. about Touch it. Touch the fall up. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. <laughs> and Sir Eric, too, yes. Sir Eric, well, don't forsake Don't forget <laughs> him. So they were all very annoyed and angry. And in January, sorry, I think it was December uh, 1969, uh, Keith Joseph sent his emissary, somebody called Nicholas Ridley, up to Scotland to talk to these people. And it was at that time that the notorious Ridley Report was put together, which taught, and it wasn't meant to be published, which taught blatantly of putting in a butcher, cutting up Upper Clyde shipbuilders, and selling off the yards for a pittance to the Lower Clyde. Just as bold as that. Unfortunately, he lost it on a train or something. I'm not quite sure what happened. You it. Yeah, you <laughs> you found it. It was got hold of. Um, and then, of course, the Tories got elected. And within a very short period of time, they had finalised their plans to run down the UCS. Uh, in January, they gave the warship yard back to Sir Eric with a dowry of four and a half million pounds. They already got compensation. He was given another four and a half million. According to uh, some oral history done a few years ago, he apparently cracked out the biggest bottle of champagne he's ever drunk on that occasion. This is how these big businessmen use their legs for the Conservative Party. So he got his yard back. And the other yards went on, and they went on struggling on the old losses wrapped up by the old owners, but nonetheless increasing efficiency and looking as though they could make their profits by the end of probably 1971 to 72. But immediately the Tory government cut off their trade credits and that meant that it was extremely difficult for them to have the, the running cash needed to operate. The government knew exactly what it was doing and then by May the management knew it was in deep trouble, and in June they went to the government and asked for additional cash. The government refused. And on the 14th of June, the government said, we cannot support lame ducks. We are going to have a more uh, effective running of this country, and we're going to appoint a special expert panel that will recommend the future. So that was the background. And it's the background to the shop steward's response. The government believed, it was totally confident when it went into this, it would win easily. And how was it going to do it? It was going to rely, as it was going to for the Industrial Relations Act and controlling the trade union movement, on certain right-wing leaders in the trade union movement to negotiate a compromise deal. Save one yard. Half a loaf is better than none. And that was what they hoped would come out of this. And that was the background to what the stewards had to respond to. What was their tactics? Keep initiative in their own hands. Don't let it go to the official movement. Build alliances both in the community and across the trade union movement to outflank flank the right wing. And to give it a name, it was Danny McGarvey of the Boilermakers. I think I'm not being on um, you, you want to say nasty things Sorry. about him. Okay. No, no. <laughs> and third, and most fundamentally, I think, exploit the weaknesses in the government's own political and economic base. Their immediate response, when the government said they were appointing the panel, they weren't going to give the money and the whole company would go into liquidation, was to mobilise their own members and the wider community through a mass lobby of Parliament, sending down a train, paid for by Clyde Bank, Town Council and the STUC, and second, to develop their own very special, unexpected tactic of response, the working. Davy will say a lot about that. But it's been claimed it was a public relations stunt or a hoax. It wasn't. It was a tactic that slowly strangled the government. 
just keep a watch on my time. I'm moving forward, I'm on page four. So I've only got 44 more pages. <laughs> Why was it such an effective <coughs> tactic? First, it exploited the legal technicalities. And I'm going to get this right this time. You're right, there's 2,000 creditors. Got it wrong last Did time. You, yeah, yeah. Well, you corrected me last time <laughs> when we were seeing another battle. Um, the liquidator who had been appointed was responsible to the creditors and not to the government. And there were 2,000 creditors who stood to lose everything if the yards went bankrupt. The people who would get the money would be, first of all, the banks and the government. And the ordinary creditors, the people who supplied the refrigeration systems, the steerage systems, the engine systems, they would get nothing, effectively, if the yard went bankrupt. And they'd obviously lose all future business. And the ship owners also stood to lose the credit they'd advanced. So there were all these creditors out there and saying we will work in, we will keep that yard running, we will raise the levy and pay the wages and we will continue to produce the ships, responded to the wishes of the creditors. And the liquidator was responsible to the creditors, not the government. Secondly, it trumped the government's propaganda. Its whole propaganda machine had gone into overdrive over the summer. We know this kind of propaganda at the moment. Wasteful and work-shy workers are what are ruining this country. We need to get discipline back into the workforce. And of course, they were preparing for what had to come. So, the working showed that the workers were defending their jobs by working, and therefore countered that whole propaganda. Third, it gave the defence of the yards, which was simply, to start with, the defending of people's jobs, a much wider resonance within the whole political system, because it became now a principle. It was defending the right to work, the right to work in your community and your trade, and not having any government take it away. So it generalised it. It was the defence of the regional economy and a challenge to the government's abandonment of full employment for the first time since 1945. And finally, it exploited the divisions in the Conservative Party's own base among regional and small uh, business. It was announced publicly on the 15th of June and as a tactic agreed by the shop stewards and the moment the government announced the expert report and its conclusions and that it was going to try and impose them, the working went into effect on the 30th of June. Now, actually, the, the, all the government records have now been opened. We know what was happening behind the scenes. It's immensely revealing. Originally, they intended just to have one yard staying open. But the export but report, probably because of the scale of the demonstrations, recommended two. <coughs> Look at the preliminary discussions before Cabinet, what do they say? Something like, this is John Davis, I am very concerned that our original objectives have been undermined by this report, but because we will not be able to keep it secret, we therefore will have to go along with the two-yard solution. But of course, that was designed itself to split the workforce and to enable Mr. McGarvey to say, well, I've got a solution, it's two yards, uh, we'll do something for the other workers, we'll set up some kind of enterprise zone, but we've got two yards. Called Govern, not Clyde Bank, obviously, because it wasn't them. designed to split the workforce. Very clever tactic. But the moment it was announced, the workers took over all four yards and wouldn't let the new management in. And David will talk more about that. This working was maintained for 15 months until total capitulation by the government. It had to invent, in the end, guarantee the future of all four yards and put in £32 million. The original amount of money that was needed was something like four to five million. That's what was asked. So they had to pay out six times as much Roughly the equivalent now of £1 billion. Pounds. And we know why they had to do it. 
We now know from the opening of the government papers what it was that decided them to make that historic U-turn. It came at the end of September and it was a report by the uh, Central Policy Review staff chaired by Lord Rothschild. It looked at what the government had done over the first year of being in power. It said it had made some progress. It had passed the Industrial Relations Act that would have fettered the trade union movement. But, it said, our ability to impose, implement it, is now challenged because of the growth of what they called extreme militancy that is making it almost impossible for those within the trade union movement with, which, with whom we hope to work to win the votes in order to be able to carry it forward. And the instance, the origins, or origins of this extreme militancy as the UCS situation and also the fact that the government was increasingly seen to be callous and unfeeling towards workers. Uh, I'm sure they'd had their people out asking people what they think of the Conservative government. Yeah, <laughs> going back, of course, they thought they were doing everybody a good turn, naturally, and that was by closing down the uh, UCS. So that was what the conclusion was, and that the government better look at its tactics in order to save its overall strategy. And that was enforcing the Industrial Relations Act. That was a document that went to the Cabinet, I think, about the 28th of September. And on the 29th, 30th of September, they started to give messages to the managing director of the Quisling Company that was trying to run Government Shipyard from a cupboard somewhere in a hotel in Glasgow. <laughs> they could start negotiating about the third yard. That's the U-turn. And, of course, the shop stewards didn't accept that. They said, we want four yards, and they went on with the working for another 15 months. But that was the key turning point. Um, and I just want to really make um, six points about how... Have I got the time? Uh, six points about how that... U-turn changed the course of history and then draw some conclusions about how it was done. First, it changed the direction of the trade union movement in Britain. Up to the summer of 1971, although there had been some opposition to the Industrial Relations Bill as it was, it had run out of steam and the a uh, liaison committee for the defence of trade unions that actually had to call off a series of strikes scheduled for May. Then, in the summer, you have the eruption of UCS. They've taken over the yards. First, the Scottish Labour Party and Scottish trade union executives have to come in on board and they have to join the demonstrations. Demonstrations and unofficial and by August illegal strikes that mobilised hundreds of thousands of people across Scotland. They had to go into an illegal working. Even Mr Wilson went in, I think very cautiously, in a motorcade with his minders. But he was being very illegal, I think, probably, wasn't he? Yep. And in that climate, the TUC in 1971 refused to go along with ratifying the Industrial Relations Act and instead said any union that registers will be expelled from the TUC. A historic change. And of course the UCS shop stewards were up in the gallery, probably Davy up there as well, doing something horrible to... Clapping. Clap. 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 Yeah. Right. <laughs> so they changed the balance. And as a result of that, ultimately, within two or three years, the Industrial Relations Act had been defeated. There had been other things that had happened. There had been 200 other occupations of workplaces across the country by the end of 1972. So many other workers had responded, looking at the lessons of UCS, in the same way to challenge unemployment and assert the right to work. So a massive change there. Secondly, 
It put the trade union movement at the head of a much wider alliance to defend regional economies, especially in Scotland. And it managed to secure direct, active support from small and medium business, local communities and local authorities. That was shown by the Scottish Assemblies, which were held in January, February, I think it was February, wasn't it, 1972. There was another one held later, before the end of UCS. Um, and that was a mobilisation that worried the government and its supporters in Scotland absolutely no end, because they all came together under the auspices of the Scottish Trade Union Congress around the issue of the right to work, but also redeveloping the regional economy on the terms set by the STUC. And the Scottish Chambers of Commerce had to come along, I think even the Scottish CBI had to come along, because they couldn't afford not to be seen to be there, because all the small and medium business were there, and the local authorities were there. So cut away that support, put the trade union movement at the head of this much wider alliance. Second, thirdly, put it at the head of a wider movement for democracy in Scotland, for the call for a Scottish Parliament, which came from the Scottish Assembly. But a Scottish Parliament, not just a constitutional assembly that would do the kinds of things I'm afraid our Scottish Government is doing more or less at the moment, but what was described by the, Secretary, the General, General Secretary of the SDUC at the time, Jimmy Jack, as a workers' parliament. It would be a workers' parliament because it would respond to the mass movement of the people of Scotland as demonstrated by the UCS and by the other struggles that were then going on. It would be interventionist. It would seek, where a firm went bankrupt, to take it over and keep the jobs. It would be progressive. It would redistribute income. And thereby, it would help the movement across Britain in terms of fighting back against the big monopolies. In Scotland, it created also a new position for the working class movement and its history as central to the Scottish identity. Uh, any of you who have seen the uh, recordings of Reid recently, if you were at the event on Saturday, you would have seen Reid making one of his great speeches where he said, we stand not for the Scotland of the lairds and the lackeys, we stand for the Scotland of the working people. And that had a resonance in Scotland as a result of that struggle. That changed the culture and attitudes of the people in Scotland, provided the basis of a new culture in terms of plays, the 784, the uh, wildcat of novels, of poetry, Hamish Henderson, Dick Gockham, uh, John Byrne, Tom Leonard, William McElvenny, Matt McGinn, and I think I've miss, missed out Billy Connolly, haven't I yet? And many more. Those were the people who now became the heroes, or the people who were able to put into words the beliefs of Scottish working people. And all the old type of Scottishness, and you know, some of us are old enough to re re remember what that was like in the 1950s and 60s, the reverence given to Kirk ministers and uh, all the other kind of old types of, not with anything wrong with Kirk ministers necessarily, some of the, of course, a lot of them actually supported the UCS. That was part of the, but nonetheless, that kind of deference went. It permanently destroyed the base of the Conservative Party in Scotland, and sixthly, it helped create the basis in which the Labour Party, which had been quite very right wing in the 1950s and 60s, in 1974 went to the country on a manifesto pledged to effect an irreversible shift of wealth and power in favour of working people. And then went on, it didn't do everything that it should have done, but it did abolish every single anti-trade union law, enforced new health and safety rules that were the most progressive ever, nationalised aerospace and shipbuilding, said it would take oil into public ownership, and it would have done if it hadn't been defeated in 1979, uh, took over uh, the motor car industry and uh, a, a range of other uh, industries, so uh, and also steel. So, um, did carry out that beginning, but of course it was destabilised and defeated, and created a deep rift finally in the Tory Party, out of which arose Thatcher, determined and her pals, determined to inflict 
a defeat on the working class and to adopt hardline policy. So I just want to conclude, and I have gone over the time, I know, um, by saying a little bit about how this was achieved. Because it was achieved by a remarkable small group of people. 8,000 workers were in the yards, so a big workforce. And within that 8,000, there was a group of shop stewards of about 100 and 200, 200 probably. And within that, there were what you could call, I think you'd call them politically educated stewards, maybe. Politically aware, yeah. Politically aware, yes. Um, of probably, I don't know, about 60 or 70. Communists, left labour, maybe non-party people, but who worked as a group. But it's a very small group. It was about 50 or 60 people. But nonetheless, they achieved this. They achieved this turnaround. And how did they do it? Well, that political awareness gave them an understanding of how that political system, economic system in which they worked and existed, how it operated. They analysed it. You just need to go back and look at what uh, Jimmy Reed and Airely, who were leading communists who attended congresses, they spoke in the congresses in a quite different way to which they speak on the shop floor, but there they analysed monopoly capitalism, the contradictions between big business and small business. They analysed the way in which the working class needed to develop an alliance that could take advantage of that basic split the way in which they could mobilise for a new form of democracy that would challenge the democracy of Westminster dominated by big business and draw out the issue of national consciousness, not in a nationalistic way, but in a democratic and progressive way in Scotland. All these things were quite explicit. They knew the situation, they analysed it, they understood it. They also understood how the government was going to manipulate the divisions within the working class. Divisions between different groups within the working class in general and how they would use the right wing within the structures of the trade union movement to manipulate and control and defuse any resistance. Their attitude was quite different from that of the right wing and when you're attacking Danny McGarvey you don't, you're not kind of saying he was necessarily the devil incarnate or he was actually operating on behalf of the government. He was doing what probably he'd been brought up to do to negotiate the best deal for people when they were being made redundant and if he could get some jobs well that was better than no jobs at all. That's what, how he thought but he didn't have any understanding of how the monopoly capitalism or the ruling class operated. So he just went down that road and the government says, well, we can make use of Mr. Mugabe by using him to negotiate a settlement. And he would have been there too. So that was a political analysis. Secondly, democracy. At every stage, they went just as far as people were willing to go. They won. They had to win every step. And they had to explain why they were doing it. And I won't say any more about that because David will talk about the democracy, the information the winning of votes. That was a model for all other types of struggle. But it was very, very important because uh, it did enable them to not just consolidate unity within the yard, because the yards could e so easily have been split in various ways, but it also enabled them to win support outside the yard and to understand the importance of not working in a kind of rank and fileist way, but also winning politically outside their own workplace. Winning the STUC, relying on others who are also politically aware within other unions and district committees and the engineers in the miners. And it hadn't been for that outside support, also working to the same agenda and understanding. It would have been very difficult, I think, for that UCS work in to be successful. Um, and they also understood, as I said, the divisions. And just to maybe end on a maybe light-hearted note, uh, one of the biggest problems that the Cabinet had, that Mr Heath had, was the ship owners on the Lower Clyde and on the Upper Clyde, on Yarrow and Lithgow. Because they had influence 
as barons within the Conservative Party. They were its godfathers. And every time they almost managed to get a deal through Mr. Mugabe, they came down pounding on Mr. Heath's door and said, if you're going to make any concessions, you can't make concessions on wages and shift patterns. We want the same as what's on the Royal Clyde. And uh, he deferred to them. And so they, he had to ask Mr. Mugabe in the crucial votes in September and then later to try and ensure the working conditions on the upper Clyde were reduced. And if there was any way of uniting the workforce, if there was hesitations, that was the way to unite it. And, of course, in the end, Heath didn't manage to get those changes. And uh, <coughs> there's uh, two very angry letters in the Cabinet papers for March 1972. One from Sir Eric Yarrow and the second from Lithgow. And it says, the government seems to me to have put a pre... This is like disgusted of Tunbridge Wells. The government seems to have put a premium, not on achievement, but on militancy. Now I personally have to justify not paying an increase on our present wages, which would cost me a million pounds out of my own pocket. So poor old Mr. Lithgow, or Sir William as he's called. It's a terribly sad end to the story. I think that's as much as I want to say. But I hope I've drawn out the political lessons about unity, about political understanding, and about exploiting the, the divisions that exist within our society in terms of the way in which big business rules us, and at the same time being aware of how to avoid big business exploiting our own divisions. So, that's it.